I want to thank everyone for attending this momentous and historic event. It is my pleasure, but most importantly, it is my honor to introduce a true American hero, Command Sergeant Major Benny Atkins. Command Sergeant Major Atkins was drafted into the Army in 1956 at the age of 22 from Warica, Oklahoma. Sergeant Major Atkins completed initial training at Fort Bliss, Texas, and was assigned to a garrison unit in Gießen, Germany. He had a follow-up assignment to Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, with the 2nd Infantry Division. He volunteered for Special Forces in 1961 and served more than 13 years with 3rd, 5th, 6th, and 7th Special Forces Group. While in Special Forces, he deployed to the Republic of Vietnam for three non-consecutive tours. His first tour lasted from February 1963 to August 1963. His second tour was from September 1965 to September 1966. It was during this tour that Command Sergeant Major Atkins distinguished himself and is the reason why we are here today. Command Sergeant Major uh, Atkins was Sergeant First Class in March 1966 and was serving as an intelligence sergeant with Detachment Alpha 102, 5th Special Forces Group, 1st Special Forces at Camp Aushau in the Republic of Vietnam. During this tour, then Sergeant First Class Atkins distinguished himself during 38 hours of close battle combat and 48 hours of escape and evasion against enemy forces March 9th through 12th, 1966. More information about this battle can be found in your press packets or on the press release. His final tour lasted January 1971 to December 1971. After Vietnam, Sergeant Major Atkins served as a first sergeant for the Army Garrison Communications Command at Fort Huachuca, Arizona and attended class number three of the Army Sergeant Major's Academy in El Paso, Texas. After graduation, Sergeant Major Atkins uh, served the Special Forces again at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and then led training at Fort Sherman's Jungle School in the Panama Canal Zone. Sergeant Major Atkins earned his bachelor's degree from Troy Strait in 1979, and went on to earn a master's degree in education and a second master's degree in management. Sergeant Major Atkins is not only a hero, he is also a teacher, a businessman, a husband, and a father. Sergeant Major Atkins taught night classes at Alabama, Alabama Southern Union Junior College for 10 years and Auburn University for six. Simultaneous to pursuing his degree programs, he established the Atkins Accounting Service Incorporated in Auburn, Alabama, serving as the CEO for 22 years. Sergeant Major Atkins had been married to his lovely wife Mary for 59 years, and together they have raised five children. Ladies and gentlemen, again, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Command Sergeant Major Benny Atkins and his wife Mary. We will now open up the floor to questions. Um, Sir, Sir Major, thank you for being here. It's an honor to speak with you today. Um, you've been selected to receive the highest military honor that the president can bestow on one of its own. What was it like to receive that call? Uh, basically, it's a very humbling experience to uh, be recommended for the uh, Medal of Honor, and it's um, uh, what I attribute this to is not my actions, but the actions of the other 16 Americans that was with us in the battle at Camp Ashow, and especially the five that Americans that paid the ultimate price. Now, all of the, the 17 Americans that were present in this battle were all awarded some type of recognition for valor, uh, 
Valor was uh, something that was just there with us, and all of the all of those 17 American Special Forces soldiers uh, were wounded, and most of us multi times. So, what I attribute the award of this Medal of Honor after 48 years is the continuing support for my for my commander and other members that is on the ground and eyewitness to the activities. And like I say again, it's a very, very humbling experience. Yes, sir. Was this the toughest battle you saw in Vietnam, or were there others? Uh, this, was, this was the toughest va battle I personally saw, but I'm sure there were others, and uh, many of those may have been m much tougher. It's something that... Uh, is uh, something hard to grasp and realize at this period of time is the fact that uh, from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, there's been somewhere between 28 and 30 million served in the military. Up today, we have 79 living recipients of the Medal of Honor. So, if I make it another 10 days, maybe I'll be number 80. <laughs> now, uh, you said during the Oak Lodge the City Council meeting on Tuesday that you received a call from uh, the president back in June. So, so uh, I guess, uh, what was your reaction when you got this? And was it hard to sort of keep that information to yourself until they can make that announcement? Uh, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, I guess, you know, once, uh, once you're an old soldier and so forth, yes, it's, uh, like I say, it's a humbling experience, especially to receive a, a personal telephone call from the President of the United States. And uh, when the President of the United States staff comes on and puts a gag order that you can't, uh, you can't talk until it is released from the White House, well, it... Uh, makes uh, you know it makes you uh, wonder yes it is it is very difficult to uh, to not talk before I was supposed to yes yes sir who could you tell Mary uh, uh, yes I did get to tell Mary and I did get to tell my daughter Mary Ann who is uh, with us today that uh, they uh, they this was uh, like I say, it's something that is, uh, it was really, uh, really uh, difficult to keep from telling, and uh, especially uh, with your friends and, and uh, relatives. Yes, sir. Has anyone indicated to you why it took so long to get to this day with the Medal of Honor? Uh, the uh, information that I have on this is that uh, there was new and substantial evidence that's released at, at this later time of eyewitnesses, sir. Yes, sir. Along that same vein, I mean, it has been 48 years. Was there ever a moment where you thought maybe it just wasn't ever going to come, the middle of the line? Well, I, I really feel that may happen today. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Major, can you tell us what you remember about the uh, the time uh, that you're be, that you're receiving the Medal of Honor for that the period of time that you you just your actions? Well, like I say, uh, number one, we were in a uh, in a situation where uh, there was uh, no ground uh, transportation to get to this isolated uh, Special Forces camp. Uh, we were. Uh, in a situation where the weather was super bad and we could not get the type of air support that we needed. So uh, the major thing is that uh, there was all uh, in that period of time, think about it, there was about 410 indigenous uh, CIDG uh, soldiers there with us and uh, of those uh, 410, only about 122 of them uh, survived and uh, most of those were wounded. So it was a horrible, 
horrible type of battle and uh, yes, uh, they, uh, there was valor all sides, not only from the Americans but for the, uh, for the uh, CREG soldiers also. What, what do you think allowed you, uh, prepared you to deal with a situation like that and for you to uh, be able to perform as you did? Uh, I think uh, po possibly uh, the training that I had in, uh, in uh, going to Special Forces and the training that I had to go through for about that year and a half uh, before they would even allow me to wear the Green Beret, well, I think that is uh, that was the uh, the one item that uh, I was able to survive. Then there's many instances in, involved that uh, assisted. In, in other words, it just was not my time that day. Uh, I was uh, blown from the mortar pit on several occasions. Uh, I. Uh, was uh, fortunate enough to go outside uh, the camp in, in with the enemy and uh, uh, get a one of our wounded uh, medevac out. I also made a trip out in the, in the minefield to recover some uh, uh, supplies that was airdropped to us. And uh, so uh, the bottom the bottom line is that it it was just not my day to be when uh, I was eventually uh, uh, escaped an evasion in the jungle. Uh, they were found uh, by helicopter and uh, notified uh, by radio that they were going to come in and pick us up. Well, the helicopter come right in and they shot the helicopter down. So it was too late and uh, too high of altitude for another helicopter. So we had to evade again, and this was uh, this was the uh, the night that it looked like they had to run us down. The North Vietnamese soldiers had us surrounded on a little hilltop, and uh, we everything started kind of getting quiet, and we could look around, and all at once, all we could see was some eyes going around us. Well. That a uh, tiger stalked us that night. We were all bloody, and in this uh, jungle, the tigers stalked us. And the North Vietnamese soldiers m were more afraid of the of the tiger than they were of us. So uh, they backed off some, and we were gone. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tiger was on our side, and uh, Argosy magazine picked us up. Uh, and uh, made a, a front page story out of it either in uh, late 66 or early 67, yes. Sir. Were you able to talk about your experiences when you got back home? Uh, yes, I'll tell you what, I, I think we were, I was probably uh, trained to such a point that uh, it uh, bothered me somewhat, but uh, you know, uh, I, I really feel that uh, most of the soldiers even today uh, experience some degree of PTSD. And uh, we have uh, ways of uh, treating this, and uh, my way of treating this was uh, more work, more family, and, uh, uh, and talk about it. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, Major, what made you want to join the Army, and, uh, and then in 1961, what uh, encouraged your decision to uh, join Special Forces? Uh, I really wanted to, uh, I had some, uh, an assignment in a garrison type unit and uh, I found out that was not, uh, the, that was not for me. I wanted something, I wanted something in the field. I wanted to be in one of the elite units and at this period of time it seemed that this, uh, that the Special Forces was the, the most elite unit of that and I was not satisfied until I, become a member of that organization. So what was your assignment with the 2nd Infantry? 2nd Infantry Division, I worked, uh, I worked some in, uh, it was a basic training unit at that time, yes sir. But that wasn't enough, you wanted to go? Yeah, that was not, that was not quite enough activity for, for me, yes sir. So now, uh, from what I understand, that you, your camp was um, removed from help for, with, from, with quite some uh, we were, Yeah, 
Yes, we were ordered by higher headquarters to uh, to uh, uh, abandon the camp. Um, and now you were you were separated from help though for uh, 50 kilometers, I believe, was was your nearest uh, aid. Um, being so far removed in that situation, did you feel like like this could have uh, happened ahead of time, and, and did it happen before this? No, I'll tell you what. It uh, after a period of time. We uh, found that uh, we were better in the jungle, in jungle warfare, than the North Vietnamese soldiers that were indigenous to that area were. So uh, the jungle was really an asset to us rather than a death. So, uh, this did not, uh, did not bother us. What are you looking forward to the most with the Washington trip and the actual ceremony? Uh, it's still uh, it's still eight or ten days away, so uh, uh, yes, sir. I am looking forward to it and uh, 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 a little apprehensive. Yes, we. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, the wife and have uh, did uh, have breakfast in the White House in uh, 2012. At that period of time, I was uh, the national commander of an organization called the Legion of Valor. And I'm one of the only pip persons I know here that spilled a dessert in the White House. But well, they'll let you back in anyway. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm curious, you know, uh, obviously it's, it's been you know, so many years since Vietnam, obviously, but are there times even now that maybe unconsciously you sort of kind of go back to like that point in time and all that, or is this sort of like a, a faint memory now no, it is not a fake memory. I, I can tell you every man that was there, and uh, and unfortunately the five that lost their life, I can tell you how that uh, that happened. So, no, it uh, uh, it diminishes, but it does not go away. Did you ever meet their families? Uh, families of one, and uh, thankfully, uh, children of one of the. Uh, one of the uh, combatants there with me, who this combatant has deceased now, but uh, three of his children are uh, going to be my guests in the White House, yes. So have you been able to stay in touch with the other soldiers that survived that battle with you? What's your relationship like with them? Uh, uh, I'll have, uh, there's seven of us living at the present time, and uh, uh, four, four are, Scheduled to attend. One is uh, one is residing in Bangkok, Thailand, and uh, he, I communicated with him the day before yesterday, and unfortunately he cannot make it. And one we still uh, we don't know if he's alive or where, but we can't locate him. So, yes, sir. Well, I, I'm in contact with him, and uh, I thank the world of of the uh, professional soldiers. Yes, sir. Sir Major, did you understand the significance of what you were doing at the time? Uh, absolutely not. We're doing our job. What does it mean to go to the White House and receive the Medal of Honor from the President of the United States to you? Uh, I, I'm sorry. Oh, I just, I'm sorry. What, what does it mean going to the White House to receive the Medal of Honor from the President? What does it mean to you personally? Uh, it's going to be, a, like I say, it's a super humbling experience and uh, I want to want it known that uh, I feel like the Medal of Honor is uh, belongs to those other 16 Americans who were there and especially the five that paid their ultimate price. Sir. Sergeant Major, you talked a little bit about uh, Special Forces um, giving you a sense of activity and you know, keeping you like sort of sharp and all that. Like once you left the service, like what did that that all that time in the service? What did that give you, like as a civilian, when you returned back to the states? They, uh, I would say, uh, probably the the most important thing that the military had was uh, a it teaches a competency and a, a desire to. Uh, do the best that you can, whatever you attempt to do. Yeah. So that, yes, sir, absolutely. In in my teaching and in uh, in the uh, businesses that I 
operated, sir. I have a question for Mary. How's all this for you? How is all it for How is all of this for you? How are you reacting to all of this attention? <laughs> well, I kind of stay in the background as much as I can. <laughs> but I'm sure you're proud of yourself. Yes, very proud. <coughs> Sorry, Major. There's some, uh, some soldiers here who are actually watching this conference today who have just graduated basic training. Do you have any uh, words of advice as they begin their career? Uh, my advice to them is uh, whether they're uh, a, a one-time soldier or whether they're a career soldier, to absolutely do the best that they can and accomplish the most that they desire to accomplish. Like the Lord had anything to do with the day, the days you were fighting? Uh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt this uh, this happened. Uh, in other words, like I say, uh, when I was on the hospital ship for a short period of time, uh, when uh, when they treated me for 18 body wounds, it uh, someone was looking after me, and at that period of time, it was not myself. Yes, sir. I agree with you. I have a question for Mary. I'll say, um, you were with your husband for a while before he went to Vietnam. I guess while he was away, I think it was three tours that he was in Vietnam. Like, what was that sense of not knowing, you know, what he was doing or how he was doing at that point? Well, the, the women now in this they can see the husbands. They can talk to them on the phone. I never did, knew where he was, period. When he left the house, I didn't, I did, sometimes, if he was where he could mail a letter, I'd get a letter once in a while. But other than that, I didn't, didn't see him or hear from him until he come home. How did you hear about this particular matter? He took 18 tell you how I had, I had two little boys I just was in school. I got up one morning to, to get them up to go to school. And when I got up, I just turned the TV on. And they were telling about this on the national news. And they were telling about this, uh, they were going through the jungle and the tiger, <laughs> tiger in the middle of them and they, uh, and I, I I just, I don't know what it was, but something just told me that it was him. And then, uh, I think it was about two days later, I got the telephone <coughs> that he was lost and they hadn't found him. And then about another day or two, <clears throat> I got another telegram that said that uh, they had, they had found that he was found, but they didn't know what condition he was in. <laughs> and then the, the, the next one I got, they said that uh, he was in the hospital and he was doing fine. So that's, that's how I found out. The first I heard was over the television, the national news. Did your thoughts go to him or to those two little boys four years ago? <laughs> I'm probably all mixed together. Sir Major, how would you describe yourself as a soldier? Oh, I'm just a mediocre soldier. I like to try to try to do better and try to do the job that I'm assigned. It's a heck of an accomplishment for a mediocre soldier. Thank you. Do you have any further questions? Well, Sergeant Major, how old are you now? Uh, I'm a young 80. A young 80. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, 
Right. 